In topic number two, we want to talk about class midpoints and frequency polygons and all of that entails. All right, now class midpoints are the number that's in the middle of the class. And this is definitely something you will see again. I'm going to tell you right now. So we really need this, um, particularly in section 3.3, but it's actually used in several sections. That's a little section symbol. It looks like two S's, All right? So section 3.3, .3, but it's actually used in many, many places throughout the course. So, um, but 3.3 .3 in particular. Frequency polygons, that's a fancy way of saying line graphs, right? So polygons are the statistics prof professor's way of saying a line graph. That's what it is. Okay. So let's start with midpoints, since I said they're very important. Um, let's see how this goes. So the number in the middle of the class. Now, that seems easy and intuitive. It's the midpoint, middle of the class. But that's kind of harder to do than you might think. I will mention right now that the middle of the class, remember that class is the word, the mathematical word we use to talk about the bins or the groups. Now, the midpoint, we're going to make a little formula for it, because it says it's the mean of consecutive less, lower class limits, but we actually haven't learned what the mean is yet. That's section 3.1. So it's true as a definition, but we don't necessarily know what that word means, although you've probably seen it in school somewhere, because the mean is what happens when you add them up and divide, right? So what we're going to do is you're going to take lower class limit plus the next lower class limit. That's what it means with consecutive. And you add them up and you divide by two. That is the formula. Write it down. It's lower class limit plus the next lower class limit, add them up and divide by two. That is the formula for the class midpoint. I'm worried about highlighting in there because I think it's going to smudge it. Yes, it will. So I'll just leave it. <laughs> All right. That's your formula. Star it. You need it. Right. It's your friend. Right. So this is the class midpoint formula. All right. And if the distribution has a consistent class width, you can use that to find the midpoints. I'll explain that in a second. Um, if it has an inconsistent class width, then you can't. Um, for example, age. A lot of time age distributions do not have a consistent class width for whatever reason and therefore we could not use um, this little trick that I'm going to teach you. So let me, let me just say age distributions. Age is one of the most common ones that I've seen um, from government websites and things like that where they won't have consistent class width. And then for open-ended classes, just use the class width. Okay, so let me show you what the heck I'm talking about <laughs> down here. Okay, so we can see that we have classes, right? Here they are. So these are the classes. And we want to find the midpoints. This is so important. This is something you will do many, many times in this class. Okay, so I'm going to start with this one because this is an open-ended classes right here at the beginning. And that's not going to be any good for me. I, I need I need a lower class limit. If you look at the way this said, it said the mean of lower class limits. I need a lower class limit, and that first class doesn't have one. So I'm actually going to start right here with the second class. I'm going to say, look, I take my lower class limit, which is 40. I add to it the next lower class limit. Do not add 49.9. That is wrong, because it's not really 49. It's not really 49.9. It's 49.9999999 forever. And unless you have the rest of your life to write nines, that's not going to work. What you do is take the next one, which is 50. You add them up and you divide by two. And actually, let me add something to the formula just a little bit. I want you to put parentheses around that front and that back. That'll help you do this mathematically correctly every time. So it's got a parentheses in the front and a parentheses in the back. I'll do it right here, parentheses, 40 plus 50, close parentheses, divided by 2. Now, technically, it doesn't have to be there, 
but it helps when you have to go do it in, say, Desmos. Okay, so let me go to Desmos and show you how to do this calculation. Whoop. I was looking up where to have breakfast with a colleague. Um, let's see here. Desmos. Okay, so let me close these out now. What I want is parentheses, 40 plus 50, close parentheses, divided by 2. Lovely. That works. If you try to do 40 plus 50 divided by 2, and you just type it like that, it doesn't work. This is wrong, right? Now, there is another way. If you hit the division sign first, if you make it so there's a division, then it makes the fraction for you, and then you can type what you need. So both of these are correct. It's just... If you're nervous about it, if, if you're unsure, then putting parentheses around it will make it so it's consistently correct. The division bar is a grouping symbol, like that. Okay, so get me back to my screen right here so we can see that it's 45. Now we can continue in that manner. Um, for example, the next one would be 50 plus 60, close parentheses, divided by 2. But I bet you some of you can probably figure out what that's going to be already, <laughs> right? So I'll hit um, parentheses, 50 plus 60, divide by 2. Oh, I don't know if you saw that. It, it actually knew what I wanted to do. I actually typed a right parentheses first, and it knew that I must have a left parentheses, and it's in gray, but that's okay. I can just do 50 plus 60, divide by 2, and it'll make it black. It'll be like, yep, that was just what they wanted. They wanted a parentheses. So um, it's just manipulating it. And again, if you hit division first, then it makes the fraction for you, and then you can type in it. All right, so it's 55. But we kind of already knew that, didn't we? Let's look at this table again, right? So we can see there's a consistent class width here. 40, 50, 60, 70. We actually already ran into this exact same data set. It's got a class width of 10. So we'll make a note. When you look at these numbers, 40, 50, 60, and so on, we have a class width that is 10. Right? All those numbers are 10 apart. It actually is true of the upper numbers as well. 39 to 49, 49 to 59, 59 to 69. It's all 10 apart. So what we can do is we can use that class width to build these. We didn't have to do this whole fraction thing. 45 plus 10 gets you 55. Right? So you can add 10 right there, and that'll get you the next number. And then you could do it again. Add 10. Right? Because they're all going to be 10 apart. So the next one's going to be 65. Then add 10 again, 75. Then add 10 again, 85. Add 10 again. Even though it's open-ended, you just add 10, 95. Going back, to work your way back up the table, this number must have been 10 away from 45. So it must be 35. Sorry. I want the cursor there for, for Desmos, but I don't want it in the middle of my screen. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so 35, right? So we're using the class width. We know that it must be plus 10, plus 10, plus 10 to work our way down the table. And even though these classes are open-ended, it still must follow that consistent pattern as long as your table has a consistent pattern. And that's what this is going on about and about up here. So this is saying if the distribution has a consistent class width, then you can use it to find all the midpoints other than the initial one. You always have to find one using the formula. So you find one of them using the formula and then you can use the class width to find all the others. Or you could use the formula for every single one of them if you wanted to, so it's fine. If it is inconsistent, then you can't do that right? If you don't have equal class sizes over here, then you can't do this adding 10 thing, because it isn't 10 for every single class. Some of them are 5, and some of them are 7, so then you couldn't do it. But most of the time, the vast majority of the time, you will have a consistent class width, and therefore you can do this. And open-ended classes, well, you saw what I did. I just said, well, <laughs> you know, they're 10 apart, so it must be 10, and walked away. It didn't make it any easier or harder. It just makes it so that I have to find kind of one in the middle first, and then build all the numbers from that. All right, next, a frequency polygon um, is drawn below. So we have a frequency polygon. You can see it's a frequency polygon because it has 
frequency written right there. <laughs> so that is a frequency polygon. You can actually do it with relative frequencies as well, or percents, same thing. Um, so circle the fake classes that is the shape of the distribution. All right, so let's go back up and read. A frequency polygon is a line graph that uses class midpoints. Uh, see, we're going to use those midpoints on the horizontal axis and the frequency on the vertical axis. And if it's a relative frequency, they would just use relative frequency. But there's fake classes at the beginning that have a frequency of zero. So let me show you. So there must have been a fake class here. So what's 10 away from 35? 25, right? And it would have a frequency of zero, right? So this is the fake class at the start. And then at the end, there's another fake class right here, 10 away from 95, which is 105, and it also has a frequency of zero. Now, why is that happening? Well, because that's what those are right here. See, it's got 25 and zero. That's the fake starter class, right? It's not real. It's not part of the table. And there's the fake ending class. They like to make it so these polygons start at zero and end at zero. And to do that, they just make up classes that don't really exist in the table. The actual first class is right here, right? That's the first class. That's the first class's midpoints. Right? So the first class's midpoint, I should make it a possessive, the first class's midpoints is right there. And these are midpoints, right? It says exam grades, but remember, a polygon uses midpoints. So these are the midpoints on that. The last class midpoint is right there. And if you manipulate this, you can kind of see where the classes are. So let me look here. 35 is the midpoint. 45 is the next midpoint. So that class in between must have started right there at 40 and be ending right there at basically the next class's beginning point, which is 50. Right? 40, it's 40 to 49.999, then 50 to 59.9. So you can actually see the classes in there. Right? That's the second class. They're there, but they're kind of hidden, right? We use the midpoint to represent that class rather than doing a bar, which is what uh, we would do, say, if we were doing a histogram. But rather than doing that bar, they pick a midpoint instead to represent that value. That's how polygons work. Um, we don't generally draw them by hand. They're just drawn for us. But they are showing the same information as a histogram, but just in as a line graph instead. And that might be beneficial for whatever reason. Now we can see that this shape of this distribution is skewed left. It has that tail on the left side. High values over here, tail over here. Got a lot of low values over here. So that is the skewed. So it's tail on the left side. It's a weird little graph. Um, it's, it's making line graphs that we learned in school more complicated. Um, it's very specialized, but it's important to just know how they work. It's particular that they're, the horizontal axis is using the midpoints. That's different. That's new. And the fact that it's midpoints means you kind of have to see where the classes would have been for a histogram.